Sailors of Reddit, what's the weirdest or creepiest thing you've seen at sea? Well, once we were motoring my 32-foot Challenger back to home port and we were fighting a king's tide, a very, very strong current. We couldn't raise our sails because we had some 25-knot winds and we weren't ready to handle that. So we were very slowly motoring along and our home port was in view when poot, the engine sputters and dies. We had run out of gas. Now we were in a bit of a situation as the king's tide started to pull us in the other direction. This in itself wasn't that scary, but we were going about four knots backwards and soon we couldn't see home ports anymore. It got dark very fast. My dad radioed the coast guard and informed them of our predicament and location. The coast guard was reluctant to help because we could just raise our sails and sail home, but at the time, my dad was the only one with any serious experience and the boat was new to us. Because we had only just gotten it, we hadn't replaced the broken mast light yet, because... Uh. Anyway, it was dark now, and even though we could have sailed now, the wind has died. We didn't have a mast light, so my dad didn't feel comfortable sailing at night. We had been out for around eight hours by then, and it was freaking me out. It was all dead silent when the radio crackling to life gave me a very real reason to freak out. It was the Coast Guard advising us to look outside. I will never forget how I looked out, and a square of the sky had been cut out and replaced with solid black. We hadn't heard anything at all, and this terrifyingly monstrous tanker was passing 20 meters next to us. We had drifted into the shipping routes, and our mast light wasn't working. It was so creepily silent. If we had been just a little more to the left... Uh... The Coast Guard came and got us pretty quick after that. I didn't expect such a negative response. I mean, holy shit, some of you need to relax. For starters, this was our first time on the boat as we had bought it that day, and we were moving it from the seller's marina to our marina. This also happened years ago when I was much younger, so my retelling of the story is simply how I remember it, and most definitely not how it actually happened. I also left some things out as I wanted to focus on the actually scary part of the story, this was very close to Christmas. We had called every place with boaters assistance and they all refused to help. The one that reluctantly agreed wanted close to two grand to bring us some fuel. We obviously didn't just spend those six hours sitting on our thumbs. We did actually fucking try to sail back, but at that point, the wind had completely died. My father has been sailing for 20 plus years, but yes, we weren't prepared to sail that day because, again, we had bought it that day. We weren't going to wait to get the mast light fixed to motor it a few miles to our marina. Again, my goal was to answer OP's question. I left things out and all of you just wanted to jump on our mistakes when you didn't even know the whole story. I've been in the US Navy for almost a decade, and I am currently on my third deployment to the Western Pacific. I work on communications equipment and spend a fair amount of time just scanning different frequencies to see what I come across. A couple years back, we were 30 to 40 nautical miles off the coast of the Philippines. It was just over the horizon, and the ship lost power. Lights, engines, everything just went silent. I don't want to say this is regular, but it's happened enough throughout my career that it doesn't bother me half as much as it should. So, power is out, emergency lights are on, and the UPS are keeping comms up until the engineers can get the power back up. I am doing my usual, scanning HF frequencies for anything coming out of the PI when my receiver starts picking up the most awful, interesting, horrific sounds I have ever heard in my life. I I heard all types of interference, it wasn't that. I've heard people trying to go over an encrypted circuit without crypto, and it wasn't that. It raised the hair on my neck and arms and made me feel very, very small. It felt like I was sitting there for hours while these sounds crawled under my skin. Like I was traveling through the warp without a Geller field. After about five minutes, it suddenly stopped and the power came back on. I will never forget the sounds I heard. Sorry I didn't give a better description of the sounds before. Even after all this time, it's uncomfortable to think about. As for the theory from the user Sakima, low frequency, LF, and even medium frequency, MF, ranges aren't normally scanned by surface ships, more so by subsurface craft.
The sounds were primal, not human. Like something very large was expressing itself, but I couldn't comprehend it. I wasn't really afraid of it. I suppose in the same way a single-celled organism wouldn't really be afraid of a human. I can't really explain it because I have never heard anything that came close to sounding like it. Maybe someone was transmitting weird sounds to fuck with anyone that might have been listening, and it was made creepier by the timing of losing and gaining power. I'm not sure, and sorry I can't explain it better. When I was 19, I had just gone to sea for the first time with the U.S. Navy. A few days after heading to the Gulf of Mexico for a few weeks of drug ops, we were dispatched to the Straits of Florida because Fidel Castro had opened the doors and people were fleeing Cuba in droves. It was called Operation Able Vigil. One night after standing watch all day over dozens of people who'd been pulled out of the water, I was standing on the 03 level of the ship with a chief smoking a cigarette. It was the only exterior surface of the ship not in coverage with refugees. It was a full bright moon that you could see reflecting on the ocean surface, and we were talking about how crazy this all was. And looking at all of the other Navy and Coast Guard ships on the horizon doing slow circles looking for people like we were. Suddenly, in the reflection of the moon, we both saw something pass through the reflection. He looked at me, and I nodded that yes. I, too, had seen something. He took off like a shot to the bridge, and the ship started to circle back towards the thing we've seen. It was a person in a life preserver just floating in the middle of the Straits of Florida, hoping someone would see him. There we were on this $2 billion missile-loaded warship doing slow circles, looking for people in the water. All told, my ship saved and or transported 1,800 people back to Gitmo for processing. Keeping in mind, ship's crew was only about 400 people, it left a big impression on 19-year-old me. Out at sea on a small fishing boat, 50 feet I think, one night after we set the gear, my brother and I chucked a shark hook to see what's out there. Went inside, chucked on the telly, and having a cone when we felt the boat move unnaturally. Checked the hook and we had a good-sized mako, estimated 14 feet, on it. Now, being a shark lover, I really wanted this thing to go free, so we tried to get it up onto the gantry to let the slack off so we could unclip it. As we were lifting it, it was getting lighter instead of heavier, and the shark was absolutely flipping out. By the time we got it above water level, from its pectoral fins down, was gone, apart from bits of cartilage, shark bone. And then we seen them. I don't know how many apart from a metric shit ton of big ass squid. If one of us had fallen in wrestling this monster Mako, it would have all been over. This memory really sticks out for some reason. Or a real creepy sound. There are a few out there is whales. On a small fishing boat, your bed is below waterline. You can hear whales yabbering. It isn't quite as relaxing as a whale song CD. Freakiest was when we had to run for shelter behind a rock. It's a well-known safe rock. If any of you have seen Deadliest Catch, they use them occasionally. Just a big-ass rock that protects you from wind and waves. We made it. The boat, three or four miles behind, didn't. They all died. Probably late to this, but whatever. I was working on a car carrier four years ago in the Middle East. Our typical route went through pirate waters at the time, and so we always picked up 4X Marines as security in Aqaba, Jordan, before we went. One night, while we were going through pirate waters off of Yemen, we started to have problems with the main engine. So we stopped and had to drift for a bit to figure out what the problem was. During this time, I was working on the stern, back end, of the vessel. I couldn't really see anything out in the ocean, everything was dimly lit on the ship. I don't know why, but I got bored, and turned on the spotlight, and there he was. This guy with a gun in a rusted little boat staring at me about 15 feet from the ship. I just stared back at him, kind of stunned. I was afraid if I reached for the radio to call one of the marines, he'd shoot me. The marines had weapons. So he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he sort of gave me a nod as if he was telling me, well played, and I gave him one back. Then he slowly rode his boat back off into the deep pitch black night. I don't know how many others there were, but I did call it in on the radio as soon as I lost sight of him. I still remember his face today. That deep, stern, concentrated look.
So I was on the Eagle, big 300-foot Nazi pirate ship the U.S. captured after World War II, crossing the Atlantic. Was supposed to go on helm or lookout watch at 11.30 p.m., slept through my alarm, woke up at 1, and realized I was late. I hopped out of my rack, went topside, and tried to head for the lookout group in hopes of hopping on with them and pretending I was there all along. As I'm walking towards the bow, imagine something out of Pirates of the Caribbean. Instead of a group of cadets shooting the bull looking through binoculars, there's just a single person who I didn't remember being part of the crew, just 50 people. He's standing with his back to me, staring straight ahead at the full moon, which is right off the bow with a reflection lighting up the water. I walk towards him when, without warning, he turns around. I'm sure at this point I've never seen him before. Flashes a creepy smile, holds up a pair of binoculars, and says, Hello, these are for you. It turned out the group that was supposed to be up there was back swapping out and the guy was just a temp who had come for the cruise at the last minute and was up enjoying the moon. But for a few moments, it seemed like I'd wandered into the middle of a horror story in the middle of the ocean and I briefly debated jumping overboard. Luckily, I did not. We followed it down to provide aid for what everyone knew was going to be a disaster. It was as if the world had split in two. Above us was this beautiful sky with few clouds strewn about, and then, not far ahead, was this ghastly monster that engulfed up the rest of the sky. It was green and purple and black. The clouds twisted in a way I've never seen before. And the seas were very deceptive. If you looked at the water you were sailing on, the swells didn't look that intense. But I saw frigates and destroyers swallowed bow first and shot through the other side. Side. I was lucky. My ship was quite large. Even we were getting pelted on the O5 level of a supply ship, T-AOE. And there, you could forget ever walking in a straight line. Most of the time, you'd be walking on the deck one moment, and then the bulkhead, wall, on the next. I've been in a rough seas before on both smaller and larger platforms, but Hurricane Katrina took the cake. It was just an event, one that I'm glad I was following and not intercepting. Night fishing just out of Melbourne. We'd been catching nothing but small flathead, so we decided to reel in our lines and head home. Felt a bit of weight on the end of the line, but there was no fight, so I figured it was just a bit of seaweed. It wasn't. It used to be a decent-sized flathead. However, what remained was barely more than a skeleton. The only skin left was a small part stretched over the skull. Behind that, all that was left was shiny, wet bone and the still intact tail fin. I pulled it up and put it on the bait board and noticed the entire thing was covered in faintly luminescent bugs, swarming all over the bone and out of the empty eye sockets and gaping mouth. This poor bugger had been swimming around near the bottom, snatched my bait, and then tried to hide in the sand. Unfortunately for him, the sand had apparently been swarming with sea lice, which had rapidly devoured him from the inside. The lines had only been in the water for five minutes or so. The sea is a vast and seemingly empty place. Many fail to grasp this when asking questions like, how can you just lose an airplane in the ocean? I found myself on my ship somewhere in the vast expanses of the South Pacific Ocean. We had been cautiously avoiding big storms, which I knew to be all around us, out further than the eye can see. Although our local ocean area was calm and peaceful, I was on watch when I noticed something out there in the distance bobbing along that I had never seen before, especially this far from land. As I got closer, I identified what was clearly a makeshift raft, made from lashed together together bamboo with a snapped mast and an empty cooler moored to the deck. Upon this raft was not a soul. The chances of coming across a raft to begin with are small enough in that part of the ocean. Thinking about the person or persons who once sailed that raft, why they sailed, and how they met their fate, that was what creeped me out.
I was sailing a small sunfish around an island near Florida in shallow water. As I cruised along, suddenly a large section of water directly in front of my bow exploded with a large splash. Immediately afterward, my boat rammed into something under the surface and came to a complete stop. My first thought was... I've hit a reef. But suddenly, the entire boat was lifted up and spun around 90 degrees, almost dumping me into the water. Then there was another big splash, and I saw something zoom away, leaving a wake behind it. I was left freaked out and shaking. Then I thought to myself, I must have hit a big dolphin. Maybe it was a manatee? Lots of dolphins around here. So I finished my sail and went home. When I got to the beach, I pulled up the centerboard and found a real surprise. A two-inch chunk had been bitten out of the wood. You could clearly see the marks of three large teeth. I'm very happy that I didn't fall out of the boat that day. Finally somewhere I can tell this story, quite possibly the strangest thing I have ever seen in my life. It was about 2am in the middle of the Atlantic and very dark with no moon. As I was walking up to the bow of our sailboat to inspect the sails, I saw a faint glow in the water a long way off. I stared at the glow for a long time before I realized there were actually two glowing objects moving quickly underwater, on a collision course with our boat. Immediately, I thought it was some submarine or torpedo about to ram our boat. But then the glowing shapes came right alongside the boat, perhaps a foot underwater. They were two ghostly blue dolphins, glowing brightly and so vivid and close in the clear water. I immediately realized the dolphins were being illuminated by bioluminescent plankton, but the sight was surreal. Imagining sailors of the past witnessing these eerie dolphin spirits and how mind-blowing it must have been. When I was off the coast of Japan in 2007, I watched a whale die. I couldn't tell the gender, but I remember hearing those faint whale cries that you can sometimes hear at night beneath the surface. The moon was full, and I could see it on top of the water, and I saw other whales passing around it. Do whales have funerals? Because it felt like a vigil or saying goodbye. You could hear the faint puffs of the blowhole spraying out water in a labored way. I don't know if it was hurt or just old. These other whales made a few passes, and then they left and the whale wasn't spouting air anymore. This was all in a 15-minute period as we cruised past. I guess the whales may have been there longer, but I feel that they know they don't want to stay around dead bodies for long. It was haunting and beautiful, and I don't think I've ever cried as much as I had that night. Not a sailor, but I was on a fishing charter boat on Lake Erie. It was around 5 a.m. in the morning, and the water was scary, calm, and glass-like. And it was so foggy you could not see more than 30 feet, if that. We all started hearing this plopping sound, like somebody was slapping the water with open hands. It kept getting louder and closer. At this point, we had all slowly moved to the other side of the boat, not knowing what the fuck it was. Even the boat captain was standing there in total silence as we all just stood there and listened to this plopping sound getting closer and closer. And to the shock of us all, a deer swam by the boat. Yes, a deer. It looked to be a very large buck with at least 10 points on his rack. We were more than 10 miles offshore, so it made no sense at all. Can you say freaky? Not me, but my father back in his commercial fishing days noticed that there was a t-shirt in the middle of his net after one toe. After a little investigation, he found that it was not a shirt, but a human torso wearing a shirt. He said he was terrified that he would open the net and a head would roll onto his feet, but it didn't happen. His captain radioed ahead and they brought the torso back to the docks, where they were met by the police and a coroner. They were eventually able to identify the body based on the clothing as a victim of a plane crash that had occurred fairly recently. My dad said he offered a free lobster to the coroner, who graciously accepted it until he found out that it had been in the net with the body. After that, he got angry and told him to throw it back. It was a foggy night off the shore of Long Island, and I was on a 75-foot schooner. The fog was so thick that you couldn't see more than 10 feet in front of you. The captain tells me there is no point to continue my watch at the bow of the ship, and Tim and I start talking at the stern. About that time, there is a thunk on the side of the ship. 
We both turned to see a figure dressed in black flowing robes walking towards us on the outside of the ship. The robes were scratching down the outside of the ship. It keeps coming closer and is high enough in the air that the top was about even with our heads. It turns out that it was just a black flag to mark a lobster pot, but for those first few seconds, it was terrifying. <laughs> During a transatlantic sail, we saw this clump of brown about 200 yards off our starboard bow. When we sailed closer to get a good look, it was six leatherback turtles all dead. It looked as if someone had intentionally caught them, tied them together, and left them for dead. We ended up cutting the lines and letting them drift apart. This, though, was no accident. Turtles don't get tangled together and somehow make perfect bow lines in double half hitches. I was pretty pissed off the next week when we arrived in St. Helena, which was kind of our halfway point, and I told the local Turtle Care Initiative, till this day, I still have no clue why someone would just tie turtles together and let them die. That had to be some sick fuck. Not my story, but my dad's. He was in the Navy on an oiler in the first Gulf War. One morning, he was shooting the shit in the mess before going down to the boiler room, and one of the other department heads mentioned he needed to go to a casino and gamble after they got back from the deployment, as they had gotten extremely lucky the night before. They had steamed through a minefield in an oiler-slash-ammo ship with enough Jet A, bunker fuel, and ammo to level several small nations. Dad said if they they had hit a mine in the right spot, he'd not have had time to even mentally process what was happening. Back in December of 2013, I was in the USCG during a patrol down by Cuba. We were about 10 nautical miles offshore at about 0300 hours. We could see this light in the shape of a cube gyrating and moving erratically. We had some pretty powerful binoculars and were studying it for the better part of an hour. As it was spinning, we could see the reflection of it on the water as well. So it was a mile or so offshore. We continued watching it and then it zipped straight up into the air. We were all pretty freaked out and just stayed silent the rest of our watch. Toilets on boats are usually plumbed with seawater because it makes no sense to shit in your limited drinking water. One night, I was taking the watch on a long-haul sail up the U.S. East Coast. We were rounding the Florida Keys about to point towards Maine. I had to use the head, so I went below and pumped some water into the bowl. It was glowing in the dark. Freaked me out so much. Turns out, there is photoluminescent phytoplankton in the water, which will glow if pumped into a dark toilet bowl. No longer scary, and actually pretty neat. Probably too late to get noticed. My grandfather was in the Norwegian Merchant Navy during the Second World War. Technically non-combatants, but still dangerous as fuck. This one time, they were sneaking out of a port at midnight that had been closed by the Nazis. They just pointed the ship out to sea in the pitch black and went, no lights. No nothing. He was standing, peering over the side into the inky blackness when he saw, like, 20 get away. A Nazi on the deck of a darkened patrol boat light a cigarette right in front of him and then disappear. I came across a man who'd hung himself on his boat five or six miles offshore about four or five years ago. The eerie and truly creepy part was realizing what it was. We just saw a boat out in the middle of oceans nowhere, without anything other than blue horizon in sight, at the break of dawn, and there was fairly thick fog, as it had rained the night before. Realizing that the figure hanging from the boom was a man was one of the most haunting things I'll ever see.